Well, let's look at God's Word today. Several verses to, uh, to go through this morning, so let's, let's get started as we look at God's Word uh, this morning, this wonderful passage of Scripture. This is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, as we approach this passage of Scripture together this morning, we again ask, Lord, that you would speak through it, through these words, to our hearts. There's a lot covered in these verses, and there's no way, Father, in just a few moments that we can capture all the things that are included in this message. But Father, I can't help but wonder, as we've gathered here on a Sunday morning, as we often do, to listen to, to your word, to hear this message, I can't help but wonder if there may be one or two things that you want us to hear, maybe something specific to any given individual in this room that maybe only you speak to their heart. I know it's happened to me before in hearing sermons. You've spoken to me in that way before, and we trust and know that you can speak today. Lord, why do we want you to speak in that way? Not just so our lives will be better, but so that we will be more likely to live lives that are worthy of you, live lives that will bring you glory and honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I was um, thinking about this passage uh, this week, um, someone came to my mind, a, a gentleman who uh, is a, was a member of one of the former churches I pastored uh, by the name of Theron Bowman. Uh, I may have talked to you about Theron before, I can't remember, but the first church I ever pastored is a small church, a struggling church. A difficult church to pastor. I don't mind saying that. It's pretty, pretty common knowledge. It was a difficult church to pastor. But um, Theron was my best buddy in that church. Theron was in his 70s uh, at the time. Theron lived a long life, and Theron had been saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and knew it. And um, Theron was the kind of guy that when I was be preaching my message, I always made sure I looked over at him because I knew that his hand was going to be doing this, like, go, you keep going, you know, that kind of thing. He was a strong, strong encourager to me. We met on a regular basis to pray, and we would meet uh, Tuesday morning, I think it was, uh, early in the morning at the church, and the, and the two of us would pray, and we prayed for that church. And I heard Theron's heart for that church expressed through those prayers. 
Theron, his deep desire was for that church to be all that God wanted that church to be. That's all Theron cared about. He, he didn't care about whether or not the church was the most popular church in the community. He didn't care about whether or not the church, uh, you know, was, was successful financially or, or was, was doing this or that that was drawing uh, praise from others. He just wanted and prayed that that church would be what God wanted that church to be. Theron's favorite book of the Bible was the book of Ephesians. He used to talk about that all the time. If I ever preached in Ephesians, he was really, really into, into the message. And uh, not long after we left that church, I got a call from Theron's wife that he had passed away, and she asked if I would travel back from Alabama to South Carolina to uh, do the funeral, and I did. And, and as I was doing the funeral, I said, well, I know what I'm going to preach from. I'm going to preach from the book of Ephesians, and I preached from a passage in Ephesians, and I said, you know, Theron used to pray for our church on a regular basis, and he used to be grieved that our church wasn't what God wanted our church to be. But you know what? Now Theron is experiencing the church as it should be, the ideal church, the perfected church in every way. And so I was thinking about Theron this week as I, as I look at this passage, and, and I really think that the heart of this message today gets to that great theme that really makes up the, the theme for the entire book of Ephesians and also is where we get the title for this entire series through the book of Ephesians, One United Body. That's who we are, the church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are one united body. And Paul begins this section of Ephesians with this encouragement. He says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, when I read this, the first question that comes to my mind is this. What is the calling to which you have been called? When Paul alludes to this, what is he talking about? Well, it's certain that Paul is referencing our calling as believers in Jesus Christ, as individual believers in Jesus Christ, each one of us has been called to Christ. Scripture tells us that no one can come to the Father, no one can come to Christ unless the Father who sent Christ draws them. And each and every one of us has been drawn to Jesus. We've been called to Jesus by God the Father in that sense. So it has to do with our common salvation call. And he's already been talking about this in Ephesians, which means that each one of us has been saved by grace through faith. We've, we've been saved from being dead, dead in our trespasses and sins. And through Christ, we've now been made alive to walk in, in newness of life. This is our common salvation calling. But I also think uh, especially based on the context of this passage, I think that Paul is speaking to us together, to us, the, the church. And, and these verses from earlier in Ephesians would, I believe, also apply to this calling that he's talking about here when he says that he urges us to walk in a manner worthy of this calling. In Ephesians 1, 4, Paul says this. He says, God chose us in Him, meaning Jesus, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. Our salvation calling is a call to holy living, both as individuals and also as Christ's church. Paul also says this in Ephesians 2. He says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for He, Jesus Himself, is our peace, who has made us both one. Remember, this means that all believers in Jesus Christ are now united in the body of Christ, no matter what race no matter what economic standing you might have, whether male or female, we are all now united as one in Christ. And Paul also says this in Ephesians 2, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, 
but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We, the, the church, is referred to, we are referred to as a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So as individual believers who have received salvation, as individual believers who have, who, um, have trusted in Jesus Christ for our salvation, the Holy Spirit has come to live in each and every one of us. But in a larger sense, we all together as believers who have the Holy Spirit living in us, each of us united together, make up the church, the body of Christ, which represents God's presence on this planet. The church represents God's presence here on earth. So you see, this is a pretty great calling. <laughs> and I think it's important, it's been helpful to me going through this, the book of Ephesians, for this, the purpose of preaching it in this series. It's imp been important to me to look at the book of Ephesians as being spoken, the words being spoken to us together. Not just us as individuals. I think we do that a lot. And, and sometimes it's rightful for us to do that. But I think sometimes we overdo that. We over apply scripture to just the individual believer and not always see it as applying to all of us together as the church. And so this morning, I want us to see this as all of us together. Together, we, the church, share this great calling. And Paul says that we, the church, should walk in a manner worthy of this great calling. So what is it going to take for us, the church, to walk in a manner worthy of our calling? Well, it's going to take several things. First, it's going to take unity. Unity. Paul says this. He encourages us to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Unity is at the heart of our calling as the church. We are literally said to be one in Christ. And this is absolute truth. We are one in Christ. And hear this, anything less, anything less than unity in our relationships with other believers means that we are not walking in a manner worthy of our calling. Does that make sense? Anything less than unity in our relationships with each other as believers means we're not walking in a manner worthy of our calling. But understand this as it relates to unity. Hear this, the Holy Spirit creates the unity. We are to maintain the unity. And that's important. It means that this kind of unity, what Paul is talking about here, this kind of unity is only available to those who are believers in Jesus Christ. It means you can only have this kind of unity with other believers. The only way you can have this unity, and the reason why the, it's the only way you can have this kind of unity, the, the reason why you can only have this unity with other believers is because it requires the Holy Spirit living in one person and this other person and this other person and this other person to have it. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have this unity. Why? Because it's unity of the Spirit. <laughs> and that's what's so important here. The Holy Spirit creates this unity. Paul says that we maintain this unity that we maintain this unity by relating to each other with, with humility and gentleness and patience and by bearing with one another in love. All of these key aspects of, of Christian character, by the way, that is produced in us by the Holy Spirit. Our role is to maintain it. And here's a very brief word about that first character trait that I think is so important listed here, the, the trait of humility. I want you to hear this this morning. Unity and humility go together. 
There is no true unity apart from humility. Do you understand that? Whether that means relationships just within this local church that require humility to maintain unity, or whether it means relationships with other people of other races. I mean, one of the reasons why we see so much racial discord in our country is because we, we have such a lack of humility. One person of one race is not humble enough to realize that they don't hold the franchise in what is right and wrong. <laughs> and so they're not willing to be humble enough to reach out to the, another person of another race who may see things differently. And so we're apart because there's no humility there. Or, or, or if, if not just relationships with other races, but just people who see things differently, people who have different approaches to life. Listen, we're the church, and, and in the church, in the body of Christ, in God's sovereign activity, He's going to provide salvation to a lot of different kinds of people. And that's good. <laughs> and so when a lot of different kinds of people have received salvation, they come together as the church, there are going to be differences. We are called to unity, not uniformity. You've probably heard me say that before. You've heard others say that. We're called to unity, not uniformity. You can have unity without uniformity, but you cannot have unity without humility. You can't. And our unity, and this is important, our unity is based on rally, rallying around those things that are really important. In other words, in the context of this passage, we are united in the ones. <laughs> the ones. What are the ones? Well, Paul says it here. He says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I'm going to fly through these really quickly. What do these mean? One body, okay? That's the church, the body of Christ. There's only one body of Christ in this entire planet. One church, the body of Christ. One spirit, the Holy Spirit. Okay, we've talked a lot about the Holy Spirit thus far in the book of Ephesians. One hope. Well, what is this one hope? Paul talks about this earlier in Ephesians chapter 1. It has to do with our ultimate salvation that is realized by our eternal glory. Our hope is not in what happens on this planet. Our hope is what's going to happen for eternity as we as, we as believers in, tri in, in Jesus Christ experience the rewards of our salvation. Not rewards based on our own doing, but rewards based on what Christ did on our behalf. We experience the riches of, of God together for eternity. That's our hope. One Lord, Jesus Christ, the head of the church. Jesus Christ is our one Lord. One faith. Okay, this doesn't necessarily re refer to saving faith or, or your individual faith in Christ, but it has to do with our common understanding of the, the content of the gospel message in its most complete form, which, which is our commonly believed truth. That's what we believe. We believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We believe that Jesus Christ came to this earth and died in our place on the cross so that we can receive salvation. We believe that Jesus Christ died on that cross and that He rose from the grave three days later. We believe that Jesus Christ ascended to be with the Father. We believe that the Holy Spirit has come to live inside of us as believers. We believe that the, that the Holy Spirit has provided uh, us with the means and the power to live the Christian life, so on and so forth. The gospel as it's presented out in the New Testament, that is our faith. There's one faith. Yes, that's exclusive. Yes, that means that the Muslims don't have it right. Yes, that means that the Hindus don't have it right. Yes, that means that the Buddhists don't have it right. I'm not here to, to slam on them, but the reality is, as we understand, we are united together under this one faith. We have, what else does he say here? 
One baptism. He probably means here water baptism. But again, that water baptism meaning an outward act that represents the inward reality of us having received salvation, us having been born again. When we baptized Lauren last week, that, that wasn't for, for her salvation. That was to demonstrate her salvation that had already happened as Jesus Christ came to live in her life and, and take over as her Savior and Lord. One baptism. One God and Father of all who Paul says should dominate our lives. Those are the ones. We are to be united in the ones, not united by one earthly leader. Whether that earthly leader be a pastor like myself, or whether that earthly leader be a, a president or, or a dictator or what have you. We're not united in that. We're not united in one political party. We're not. It's not part of the ones. We're not united in one really great cause, and there's some really great causes out there, and I'm not talking about the gospel here. I'm talking about other things extra to the gospel. We're not united in those things. We're not united in one region of America. We're Southern by God and proud of it. That's not what unites us. We're not united in, in a heritage related to that one region in America either. It's not what unites us. We're not united by one race. If you're white, if you're black, if you're Asian, whatever your race is, is, is the church, that's not what unites us. It's not part of the ones. We're not united in one sports team. I feel like Fonzie just couldn't get it out. There's nobody in this church is crazier about sports than me. I, I, I say that with a pretty great deal of confidence. Maybe Mark Jones. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but that's not what unites us. And, and let me tell you, I'm all in with the Astros. And I've never been as united in a, with a community around a sports team than with the Astros because of what we went through together with Harvey. And, and I'm all in, and, 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 and I might even wear my Astros jersey next Sunday. I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm all in. But that's not what unites us. It's not the ones. We're united in the ones. You see what I mean here? Often we, uni we seek to unite around things that really don't matter, things that are less than the ones. And we cannot walk in a manner worthy of our calling as individual believers or as a church unless there is unity. Unity. Unity of the Spirit. He creates it. We maintain it. And it's based on all these things that are truly, really important. But another thing we're going to need if we're going to walk in a manner worthy of our calling is gifts. Gifts. This is what Paul says. He says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then he says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. There are two important things to quickly point out here. First, God has gifted you to serve. As a believer in Jesus Christ who has the Holy Spirit living in you, God has gifted you to serve. This is implied in Paul's statement about grace being given to each one of us. The word for grace and the word for gift is basically all the same here, okay? It's a great way to look at grace. Grace is a gift. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He's referring to these gifts, about spiritual gifts, which each person who is a believer in Jesus Christ has been given to use in service of in the service of building up the church. Now, he doesn't list those here. And so I'm not going to go into detail at this point. But understand, if you are a believer who is not using your, your, the gifting 
If you're not using the gifting that God has given you to serve His purposes in the church, you're not walking in a manner worthy of your calling. Because that's why He gave it to you. Not so you'll be a better realtor. <laughs> not so that you'll be a better mom or dad, though that's very important. But He gave you that gifting to help build up the body of Christ. And if you're not doing that, you're not walking in a manner worthy of your calling. But, but also, God has given your church leaders as gifts. This is what Paul says here. Paul says, He gave the, apostle and the apostles and the prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers. He gave them. Not that He gave the gift of these things to these people, but that He gave these leaders to you, <laughs> the church. Your leaders are gifts to the church that God has given. Now, I don't have time to expound on the specifics of these leadership roles mentioned here and whether or not each one of these is in effect today, which is a source of great debate. But just understand that God calls and gives leaders to the church. God doesn't give employees to the church. God gives leaders. And I think it's important to think about this, and I'm so grateful to be able to have this conversation with you because I have great confidence in who you are as a church. Do you view your church staff as employees to be managed or as gifts from God? Some churches struggle with this because some churches see their church staff as employees. And employees are there to serve the members. You know, we're a country club, and we have our employees who take care of, our, of the members' needs. I've served in churches who viewed their church staff, myself included, in that way. And it's not a happy place to be if you're on staff. Now, what I'm not saying here is that all of us who are on staff in churches or leaders in churches should have an overinflated view of ourselves, and we go around saying, look at me, I am your gift. I, in God's wisdom, He knew exactly what you needed, and He gave you me. That's not what we're talking about here either. God has given your church staff and other leaders, people who aren't being paid, as gifts to help you as a church be all that God wants you to be. And I think it's an appropriate time to stop right here and look at your own church staff and say, what a great thing God has done in gifting you with them. You know, I don't look at Paul or RJ or Casey as employees. Now, it's my responsibility as pastor to, to provide oversi oversight and, and, and supervision in a sense, but I don't look at them as employees to be managed. I look at them as gifts from God to be set free <laughs> so that they can do what God's gifted them to do. And I wish I did a better job of helping set them free to do that because it's very obvious to me when I look at each one of them that God has gifted them and He has given this church, these people, as a gift. And today we celebrate Paul. I mean, 10 years, come on. That is a gift from God to this church. You can't put a price tag on stability like that in the life of a church. Consistent, faithful ministry over time and the effect that it has overall on a church. I mean, all of us who are on staff have, have, have come significantly after Paul. <laughs> so Paul has been here through some pretty significant times in the life of this church, sometimes that were extremely difficult when there wasn't other staff around to, to help carry the load. That is a gift from God. So tonight, when we celebrate Paul's anniversary and Dina, because we also consider Dina to be a gift as well, we're not just saying, look at what this great employee of the church has done. We're saying God gave them to us as a gift. 
That's what we're celebrating tonight. We're, we're honoring them, but we're, we're thanking God for the gift. I, I, I've camped out a little bit here, but I really do think this is an important perspective because I really know, I've seen churches struggle with this. Not our church. I really believe that. I'm not just saying that because I better say this so that, you know, I really mean that. I, I've been in other churches that struggled with this. Because they didn't understand that, that their leaders were not people to be managed. They were people to be, to thank God for as, as those helping them be the church God wanted them to be. And that's exactly what we have here. We need gifts. God has given you each one of you, a gift to use to help this church to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And God has given leaders to this church to help us to do the same together. We need this. It's going to take this if we're going to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. But one more thing that it's going to take, it's going to take growth. It's going to take growth. Why does Paul say that God gave certain church leaders to the church? Why did God give them as gifts to the church? Well, it's very clear. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. For building up the body of Christ. So the idea here is that the leaders equip the people for the work of the ministry, which has as its intended result the building up of the church. It has as its intended result church growth. Which, by the way, probably has a deeper meaning than what we might normally think today when we say the phrase church growth. Notice these phrases that emphasize this growth. Paul says that we are to grow into mature manhood. Now that isn't specific to men. That's to all of us. We need to be mature adults, basically, is what that's saying. We need to grow into mature manhood. He says we need to grow to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He says that, that, that we need to grow so that we may no longer be children. He says we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ. He says that when each part, each one of us as, as part of the body, when each part is working properly, that our giftedness makes the body grow. And he says that we need to grow so that us as the body, so that it builds itself up in love. Growth, growth, growth. But today, when we define church growth, we're, all, we're almost always talking about numbers. We need more people. That's what we're talking about. And so we say a church isn't growing when it's not adding numbers. That is not biblical gro church growth. Not as Paul defines it in this passage. And Paul is really spending some time here talking about what it means for the body to be built up and to grow. Biblical church growth means growth in spiritual maturity and love. And this kind of growth manifests itself in several important ways. It means growth in unity. Unity is a sign of maturity, by the way. You look at a church that is unified, you can also say that's, that's a spiritually mature church. In fact, that's why Paul called the Corinthians spiritually immature. Why? Because there were divisions. He, he pointed as that as a sign that they were not spiritually mature because they were divided. They were divisive. If they're divisive, if there's divisions, that's a sign that there's not any spiritual maturity. Growth, unity is a sign of that. Uh, it, it also means growth in sound doctrine. This is so important, and it's, 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 it was, it's always been important. It's never not been important for us to grow in doctrine. But it just seems more important today as we look around us and we see several things. One, we see rampant biblical illiteracy. People don't know the Bible like they used to. And a lot of what people are believing in isn't coming from the Bible. It's coming from some skewed version of maybe what the Bible says that's been passed down from one person to another, but they've never read it themselves because they haven't read the Bible. 
and they're being tossed to and fro by whatever wind of doctrine is being passed around because they don't know the Bible. Growth in doctrine is extremely important. Doctrine is not a dirty word. It is so important. It's part of what it means to be built up and to grow as a church. We grow in sound doctrine. It also means growth in Christ-likeness. When he said, uh, we are to uh, grow in the, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It means becoming more like Jesus. Listen, to me, that's, that's one of the great definitions of your spiritual growth. Are you becoming more like Jesus? As a disciple of Jesus Christ, are you becoming more like Him? That's a great indicator of your spiritual growth. Now, what does it mean to become more like Jesus? Well, it means a lot of things. We can't, you know, put it into one little pinpoint. But it certainly means developing His character. The character traits that were evidence in Jesus become evident in your life as the Holy Spirit works in you. It, it certainly means, you know, what is important to Jesus being important to you. His mission being important to you. Is, is, it certainly means that. It, it means the way you treat other people. You treat them as... as, as as, as Jesus treated people. You know, it's all these things, so many things we could say, but Christ's likeness is a sign of, of, of growth. And when you see it happening collectively as the body of Christ, it is a beautiful thing, and by the way, will affect our community as nothing else can. If the people of Pecan Grove, let me just... Don't go any farther than that, okay? If the people of Pecan Grove look at this church and say, boy, those people are like Jesus. Oh, my goodness. What more could we ask? What more could we ask? And what more of an impact could we have in our community than that? Because, by the way, Jesus is active. He's not passive. So if we're becoming like Jesus, we're going to be making a difference in the community, too. Listen, all of these things, growth in unity, growth in sound doctrine, growth in Christ-likeness, result in being built up in love. Pay attention. We talked about that in Bible study this morning. There's your thunder to mark this moment. The result, it results in being built up in love, and love is the ultimate sign of church growth. The ultimate sign of church growth is true biblical love. That's growth. That's what Paul's talking about here. He's saying if we're going to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, we need to be growing. There needs to be growth. And I'm not saying that numerical growth is not important, and I'm certainly saying this, that if, if we're going to do these things that Paul's talking about here, and if you're going to use your gifts to build up the body of Christ, that also means new people who are coming into the body of Christ being discipled as well. So that's also part of it. New believers coming into the faith as well. That's important. But we do a disservice to the New Testament and a disservice to our calling when we reduce it to numbers. And we evaluate a church as being successful about, based on whether or not there's a lot of people there or not. That could be one of the reasons. I mean, maybe there's something good is going on there. The Holy Spirit is working and that's why people are being drawn to that. But it doesn't always mean that. And it doesn't always mean that a church is not growing if they're, if they're not the most popular church in town that's drawn a big crowd. We've got to evaluate things differently. And the only thing I'm saying this morning is we've got to evaluate the way Paul is evaluating it in Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. This is how he is defining growth in the body. He is not telling you to use your spiritual gift to draw a crowd. He's telling you to use your spiritual gift to build up the body. And he's saying that your leaders are to equip you to be able to do that. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. So I, I leave with this, and I'm, I'm finished because I really don't have anything else to say. I leave you with this. Pray for your church. Pray for your church. I, I urge you, to pray for your church. And as I do that, I think about my friend Theron Bowman. 
And, and I want to encourage you to pray for your church the same way he prayed for his church. That this church will be all that God wants it to be. That as you pray for the church, pray that we will be unified. We'll be one in Christ. We'll rally around the things that really matter, not the things that don't. Whether that be in our inner workings, in inner personal relationships here in the church, our Facebook postings, our chatter in the office, or what have you. We rally around the things that really matter. The ones. Pray that we would use the gifts that God has given us to build up the body of Christ and that we would appreciate the gifts that God has given us through our leaders and other things. And pray that we would grow as God wants the church to grow. Pray for that. And if you pray for that, you're going to be praying along with the heart of God for this church. This is what God wants. He wants it so much that he set it up this way, to be this way. By giving us unity in the Spirit, <laughs> by giving us these gifts to help us build up the body, and by helping us grow. What is it Paul said? I planted, Apollos, the other church leader, watered, but God made things grow. That's what we want. When that happens, we'll be the people, the church God wants us to be, and we'll be a church worthy of its calling. Let's pray together.